Welcome back. Joining us is Ruben Navarrete from the Washington Post Writers Group. His career as a journalist and radio talk show host began when he graduated from Harvard. He has worked as a reporter and editorial writer for the Arizona Republic, the San Diego Union, the Dallas Morning News, and CNN. He currently, besides his two columns a week, contributes to the Daily Beast. His nationally distributed columns are read by a lot of people. He is the number one read Hispanic columnist in the nation. I'm number two. <laughs> so, viewers are assured of the best Hispanic political thought in the United States of America. Ruben, what do you think about Steve Bannon, former presidential advisor, being indicted by a federal grand jury for ignoring a congressional subpoena? Ro, great to be back with you again. This is exactly what you said would happen a few weeks ago when we talked about this. You said that a congressional subpoena to testify was nothing to be uh, messed with and that Steve Bannon was risking being apprehended, arrested, and now being uh, indicted for, uh, for contempt of Congress. So I think it's significant that they're, the Democrats are drawing a line. They're serious about holding uh, people accountable for January 6th. They wanna know what Steve Bannon knew, what Donald Trump told him. They wanna know specifically about whether they can draw a direct line from the events of January 6th, this violent insurrection to the former president. And they're doing it not just to look backward, but also to prepare for the future. And this idea somehow that uh, President Trump may run for president again. So this is kind of a Democratic insurance policy, just in case he does that. Um, but the other point of this, I think that's important, uh, Raul, is certainly um, there is a tension that exists in politics between looking backward and looking forward. And I think that likewise, Republicans oftentimes look backward when they should be looking forward. And uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of the Republicans who think the last election was stolen, they're looking backward. And there's a debate going on in the Republican Party saying, no, we're never going to win that way. We have to look forward. And so that's the tension that exists. And for Democrats, they have a choice to make, too. Do you guys want to continue to look at January 6th? Or do you want to look at things like the, the victory of Glenn Youngkin, the governor now and governor-elect in Virginia, and how it is that he won by talking about grocery tax and, and gas tax and education? Maybe those are what the things you should be focused on, not January 6th. I don't have an answer for this. I just know that there's a choice. Do you want to look forward or do you want to look backward? Well, I think, uh, first of all, I think January 6th is one of the most important dates in American history, besides my birthday, January 15, 1941. But uh, <laughs> they, I really, really think so. And I think that they can. There are legislative solutions to part of the, those problems that occurred on January 6th. And there is, a, for example, a tightening up of the insurrection law, which is uh, almost, well, it's over 200 years old. Uh, and it was passed in the early 1800s, as I recall, I think 1807 or so. So I think that can be tightened up because, uh, for example, a lot of the supporters of January 6th will look around innocently and say, well, nobody was armed. Well, tell that to police that were struck and injured. Yeah. By, by poles and, uh, and clubs. Hockey and, sticks. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, whatever. Yeah. And, and police batons that they took away from the police. Uh, yes, that's, of course. Uh, what kind of weapon you're armed with should be stipulated in a law. In other words, anything that you, if you touch another person, in this case an officer, with anything but your hands, that should be a separate charge. Uh, you know, yeah. if you... If you strike a federal officer, a regular, an FBI guy or an IRS guy, if you hit one, that is a federal crime unto itself. And that's with your fist, not with a, a weapon. That's yeah. another charge. All this, is, all, all this is true. Accountability is important. You see it just this week, Raul, you saw the story about the um, uh, fighter, the, um, you know, the street fighter who hit, uh, got the longest sentence so far, I believe it was 18 months. So we're, that's good that you arrest these people, that you prosecute these people, that you hold them accountable. I'm talking about the effect of politics and how it plays up on politics, because just like there's a tendency among the, the Republicans to look back at the last election and say, oh yeah, that election was stolen. Uh, Donald Trump was really the person who was elected. Uh, we need to look at Arizona and we need to do an audit in Arizona of the election. <laughs> 
um, there is a sense the parties kind of lose the electorate. They lose the voter because the voter is worried about their bills every month, month to month. And they're worried about real issues today. And they're not worried about January 6th anymore. So it's kind of a case where you could win the battle and lose the war. I agree with you. There should be accountability for January 6th. I also agree that it's a very dangerous strategy when either political party spends all their time looking backward and offers me nothing as a voter about what lies ahead looking forward. Well, I think politically, uh, you're probably right. And uh, the Biden administration so far has not reached that conclusion. But we're talking about Congress here. Congress has got a job to do, and that's one thing. But the Biden administration has totally screwed up their presentation to the public. I mean, this infrastructure bill so far hasn't affected anybody. But some money will, be, will start to be spent within the next few weeks by, st by agencies. They will be looking at plans, and if, if, if they won't listen to me, but if they were listening to me, they would make a really big deal about this. The, the president going to Michigan this week to sell his infrastructure bill, the bill passed. He doesn't need to sell it. What he needs to sell is its effect. And that is to go into Grand Rapids, for example, where they're going to fix the water supply and stand there at the water plant and say, we're going to fix the water uh, situation here in Grand Rapids and have state people say, yeah, here are the plans and this is how we're going to do it. And we're going to start in 97 days or something like that. That's the kind of politics that I'm talking about. That's retail uh, stuff, selling your best, putting your best foot forward. And they're not doing that. But let's, let's uh, change the subject a little bit. We got a congressman from Arizona, Paul Gosar, Gosar. And I talked about him in the first uh, uh, segment of today's program. And I'd like to know what you have to say about it because you are a former reporter and editorial writer for the Arizona Republic, which is the main newspaper in Arizona. So give us your Arizona view or your Arizona right. veteran view of Paul Gosar. Well, you see, uh, Roll, this dynamic at play where what plays in Arizona, what's comfortable there, what may uh, make or get a chuckle from uh, Arizona Republicans who support Gosart uh, could get him in trouble you know, nationwide. Uh, and, and here that's the case because uh, he was circulating a, uh, a was it a tweet uh, that showed basically uh, a caricature of him killing a fellow member of Congress and that's uh, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez from New York. And so it may play in Peoria, as they say, in Arizona, that this is something that he thought was harmless, but ultimately it's something that AOC and others pointed to as an example of Republican extremism, that Democrats are smart. They know that that hurts Demo uh, Republicans with independence. Uh, it hurts them with even Republican women in many cases who do not like these personal attacks and just want people to do business, just go do work. You know, why are we sending you to Congress to go do work and to help make my life better, not to engage in these sophomoric games uh, about, uh, you know, jokes about killing a fellow member of Congress. And so the Democrats are smart. They have seized on this example to point this kind of extremism. The Republicans are shrugging it off, saying, oh, it's no big deal. They're making too much out of it. Um, but this is another clear example of what playing at home, something that may play well at home, or at least not hurt you at home, could hurt your party on a national level. For those who are watching this uh, that aren't familiar with Arizona, uh, ladies and gentlemen, there is a Peoria in Arizona. There is it's a Peoria a, it's in Arizona. A suburb, yeah, yeah, it's a suburb of Phoenix. And in fact, that's where the San Diego Padres have their, uh, their mm -hmm. winter training uh, a program. Uh, they built a ballpark there and all that. And that's where Major League Baseball starts now. The old days of Florida, the Grapefruit mm -hmm. League and all that. Right. Uh, those days are all Now gone. it's Arizona. Most, most are, uh, yeah. are in Arizona. Now, uh, so I, let me reiterate what you said. And what Paul Gosar did was put up a tweet with, with an enemy cartoon showing him killing and cutting off the head of Alejandra Ocasio-Cortez, I love saying that. <laughs> uh -huh. and, uh, and then attacking the President of the United States. Now, let's compare him to Stephen King, former Republican Congressman from Iowa, whose big mouth, ex how should I put it, 
racism it, it came out of his mouth with every other word and every other sentence. Finally, the Republicans got tired of it, and they, Kevin McCarthy kicked him off of all his committee assignments. So all he did was sit around and watch CNN all day because he wasn't allowed yeah. to, to do his job. And then he ran for re-election and was finally kicked out of office. The call now by Nancy Pelosi and others is that uh, Paul Gosar should be stripped of his committee assignments and put into congressional purgatory. And that's what this deal is all about. Do you think that he should be stripped of his committee assignments? Yes. I, okay. I think that's appropriate um, uh, for a couple of reasons. One is Republican used to, Republican Party used to believe in accountability. Uh, in the 1990s, they talked my ear off about how, you know, if it was African-Americans or Latinos and it was street crime, the issue was accountability. You need to have tough sentencing laws because people need to take responsibility for their actions. Uh, you can't have amnesty, they said. Republicans don't like amnesty, they said, because it's not you shouldn't reward bad behavior. And people who come to the country illegally should not just be able to stay. We need accountability. And so now I take that same Republican you know, prayer book and I play it against them and I say, this needs accountability. You can't let this person get away with it. But the other reason I think it's important is because of what we said earlier about January 6. You have to understand that the idea of threatening violence against a member of Congress now, today, in November of 2021, means something different than it did 10 years ago, or even you know a year ago, two years ago. So because of January 6, it's much more feasible, plausible that uh, some fanatic could look at this video and think it's okay to hurt members of Congress, literally try to storm the Capitol, uh, yelling about the vice president of the United States, hang Mike Pence. Not just, this was not just attacking Democrats. This was saying, get Mike Pence out of the Capitol and hang Mike Pence. Uh, so I don't think this is a time for lawmakers to joke about violence onto other lawmakers. So I could make a, I can make a strong argument that for those two reasons, he should be stripped of his committee assignment and probably more. Good. Well, listen, we've got a couple of minutes left and uh, I've asked the other question in my mind that I'd like to hear your answers to, but uh, let's you, let's you pick a subject for, to give us two minutes that you want to rant about or discuss or whatever yeah. and accountability for. Yeah. Give me There's two a lot going on worth. right now. There's a lot going on right now. One is regarding critical race theory, uh, and that's an outgrowth of the Virginia uh, governor's race. And the fact that Americans, let's just start there, that Americans have reached a point where they don't want to have this conversation. They don't know what to say about it. They don't know what, how to talk about race in America. We've gone from a time period in your lifetime, role where you were growing up, white people, all they did was talk about race. All they did was say, as a Mexican, you can't go into that barbershop or that swimming pool or that restaurant. And now we're at a different place uh, at this point in your life where white people don't want to talk about race and they don't want to talk about critical race theory and they don't want to talk about race in education or public schools or any of these things. And they get nervous when you talk about things like systemic racism and policing. And so this has become now a national topic, a discussion, not just because of what happened in Virginia, but it's on my mind because I'm writing a column about it this week. And I'm just struck by the fact that black people and brown people seem to have a better understanding of what critical race theory is than the white people who are against it. So I'm fascinated that a bunch of people are against something that they can't define. They don't, ex they can't explain it. They don't know what it is, but they know they don't like it. And uh, that's where we are in America today. Well, let me just say that as a nine year old, I was in Texas on my first visit there of many and a barber refused to cut my hair and yeah, I was nine years right. old. Now you tell that yeah. to a white person and they go, Oh, yeah. that really happened. Yes. That really right. happened to me, you know? And so right. anyway, Ruben Navarrete, we welcome you here uh, periodically and we trust that the audience does too. We now have a major statewide audience in the state of Baja California. So we have a lot of people watching this and you're getting well known in your own backyard. Thank you, Ruben Navarrete, for being with us and we will see you again in a couple of weeks. We're going to take a break now. Thank you, my friend.